right, we're going to talk about biological contamination. So how can it be, can things become contaminated? People sneezing, hand-to-hand -hand contact, people not handling stuff the, wrong, the, the right way, having dirty uniforms or, or dirty or uh, soiled equipment that you're using, and the microorganisms get mixed in with the food. All right, cross-contamination, that is simply if you are cutting on a cutting board with raw chicken, meat, fish, whatever, when you're done, you must remove the cutting board, clean and wash and sanitize the area. Make sure that you clean, wash and sanitize the knife you were using, the cutting board you were using before you start again. Make sure you wash your hands. Problem happens when somebody simply is handling raw meat or fish on the cutting board and then they remove it and they don't wash, rinse, sanitize, clean the cutting board and then they put something that's ready to eat or RTE food like a salad or a cucumber or something like that on that same cutting board, that's cross-contamination. Other problems occur in storing the food. Um, you want to make sure that you put your the food that's ready to eat on the very top, the food that is that needs to be cooked on the bottom. And a good rule of thumb is you want to store it from the bottom to the top, the stuff that needs to be cooked the most. And by the most, I mean the proper internal temperature. So chicken has to go to 165. That should always go on the bottom. And then your fish is 145 and above that. You're going to or actually be even below that. You'll have your ground beef at 155. However it's cooked to, that's the layer in which it should go into the walk-in cooler or refrigerator. The big six, there are 40 different kinds of microorganisms, and there's no way we're going to be able to go through all of them. But there are six big ones, Singilla, Seminella typhi, uh, Seminella, E. coli, Hepatitis A, and Neurovirus. These are the six big microorganisms that will cause the most trouble. Um, Seminella typhi is usually transferred through drinks through water. All right, symptoms, foodborne illness, diarrhea, vomiting, fever, nausea. Abdominal cramps and jaundice, which is the yellowing of the skin and the eyes, like the white part of their eyes. Um, not everybody will have the same symptoms. Um, and also, it could the onset of these symptoms could take between 30 minutes and six weeks. It really depends on what you've eaten, how your body handles these things. Some people will eat it and feel a little discomfort, but won't, won't feel bad at all. Some people will get, you know, really, really, really sick. All right, there's four different types of pathogens that can contaminate food and cause foodborne illness. Bacteria, virus, parasites, fungus, and uh, fish toxins. First one we're going to do is bacteria. All right, so the location, they're everywhere. They're on our body as we speak. They're on your body and they're on my body. After you take a shower, you come out, they're still there. There are some bacteria that are good and they help us and they're healthy for us. And there's others that are not. Those are the ones that make us sick. Um the detection, you don't know that they're there. You can't see them. You can't smell them. You can't taste them. All right. Uh, the growth, they will grow great. They, they, they multiply, they divide, and, and they, they, they double every 20 minutes. So if you have two, 20 minutes from now, you'll have four. 20 minutes from then, you'll have eight. 20 minutes from then, you'll have 16. Um, and the fat time we're going to go over next, those are the, the conditions that uh, allow microorganisms to grow or or encourage them to grow. And the prevention, the best way to prevent uh, bacteria is uh, through uh, um, time and temperature control, which we're going to talk about in the fat tom. So next is fat tom. Food, acidity, time, temperature, oxygen, and moisture. All these things can either encourage or stop the grow of microorganisms. So food is the first one. Uh, microorganisms want food. They want something to eat. Their favorite is something that's high in protein, something like meat, poultry, dairy, eggs, cheese, that kind of thing. All right. Acidity. They do not like acid at all. Something that has zero to no acid is where they'll grow the most. Uh, temperature. The temperature danger zone is 41 degrees to 135. Um, you're going to want to keep your food out of the temperature danger zone as much as possible, especially RT, not RTE foods, um, TCS foods, time uh, control substances. Food that um, like meat, fish, poultry, cheese, egg, all the ones that are high in protein, you want to pull them out, you want to prep them, you want to cook them, and you want to serve them. You do not want them sitting out uh, for any longer than they have to be. You have to be really careful when you thaw food Make sure that you thaw it the proper way. Under refrigeration is the best way. 
Um, make sure that when you're cooling food, you bring it from 135 down to 70 degrees within two hours and then from 70 to 41 within the next four hours, six hours total to get it down to 41 degrees. Um, make sure when you're cooking food, you cook it to the proper internal temperatures. Um, make sure you use a thermometer to make sure that you're hitting the proper temperatures. And then when you reheat food, doesn't matter what you reheat, must go to 165 and you have two hours to get it from wherever the refrigerator state is to 165. Temperature, or excuse me, time. Um, time is the other part. Every, like I just said before, every 20 minutes, you have two, you're going to have four, then you're going to have you know, eight. Um, every 20 minutes, they're going to multiply. So you have to, so time is of the essence. You can't leave it out in the danger zone. Um, Serve Safe says four hours max in the danger zone. What I'm going to tell you is that you want to reduce the amount of time it's in the danger zone as much as you can because you don't know how long it was sitting in the danger zone before it actually got to you. So the, the, the max you're going to let it do is four hours, and you want to reduce that if you possibly can. Oxygen, all right? Um, while the microorganisms like oxygen and help them grow, they all don't need to have it 100% of the time. They can go into a dormant state, into like a spore state, and wait for the for the um, the conditions to get good, and then come back. Um, so just eliminating the oxygen doesn't eliminate the microorganisms, but it will slow them down. All right, moisture. Uh, bacteria will grow in food with high moisture levels. It likes a lot of moisture. Something that's dry, um, like. If you have uh, lox, lox is nothing more than a, a side of salmon that you pack in salt. Pack it really tight in salt, and what happens is the salt draws all the moisture out of the fish, so the microorganisms cannot grow. Okay, so the next one, you had bacteria, now we're on virus. The difference between a bacteria and a virus, bacteria can grow in food. It doesn't need a host it just needs a place to live, and it needs all the conditions that I just gave you in Fat Tom. A virus, however, cannot grow in food. It needs to be introduced into the food by a human. It will not grow. It will not feed off of the food. It doesn't do it. It needs a live host. The live host would be either us as humans or animals. Um, what will happen is the virus will get into the animal, usually through their eyes, their nose, their mouth. Um, once they get in, the virus will attack the cells of that host and it will transform the cells into being the same as the virus and therefore making the person or the animal sick. Um, the source of the virus can come from food, from water, or um, contaminated surfaces. And they get contaminated by people touching people, people touching the food or the food area where the food's being handled, or from people and animals to surfaces or the water. Um, if the water is contaminated, the virus, you know, if the water is contaminated, anything you you water with that, any kind of vegetables or produce you water with that and don't wash it, the virus can still be there. And then destructions. It's important that you understand that viruses are not destroyed by normal cooking temperatures. Hand washing, personal hygiene, proper handling of food at all times through all the steps is the best way to stop the spread of viruses. Uh, neurovirus is the leading cause of foodborne illness in the United States today. All right, the next uh, category is parasites. Parasites must have a host to live. On the right-hand side, you'll see that I have uh, ticks and I have worms. Um, commonly found in seafood and wild game. And the reason for that is no one's controlling where the seafood is, what it, what it eats, what it swims through, swims through, and wild game, the same thing. No one's controlling that. And then the other thing that it can do is can, it, can, it can come in contaminated water. So if the parasite is, is swimming in the water and then you use that water to, to, uh, to water um, produce and then you don't wash the produce, that's how you can get uh, um, uh, parasites inside of a human body. And the prevention is uh, purchase food from approved vendor, reputable suppliers, and make sure you cook all, um, all things to a proper internal temperature. Uh, fungi, basically it's mold. Um, mold, yeast, and mushrooms are the, th are the three biggest ones. The main thing I want you to understand here is you need to buy your mushrooms, again, from a reputable supplier, one that you know is following all the guidelines. Please don't walk through a forest and say, oh, look, there's some mushrooms. We can save some money. Let's pick these and eat them. You have no idea whether they're poisonous or not. Uh, you have no idea whether the, the, because a mushroom is a fungi. 
Um, there are certain ones that are edible and certain ones that aren't. You want to make sure you're buying them from somebody who has grown them specifically to be eaten. Um, and the best way to prevent uh, fungi is if you find mold, like up there, up here on this piece of bread, best thing to do is throw it away. All right, uh, biological toxins, right? Some toxins happen naturally in certain fish, all right? So there's one called uh, histamine, and um, the pathogens are on the fish, and they're okay as long as they're handled properly. But when they're not handled properly and their time and temperature are abused, then um, these these fish can um, can make you sick. And that's tuna, mackerel, mahi-mahi. Um, again, if they're handled the proper way, you don't have an issue. And then there's ciglatera. Um, that is a, uh, it's common with larger fish. And these fish are the ones that eat smaller fish that have been, um, that are infected and um, have fish toxins. So barracuda, snapper, grouper, and amberjack. Um, down here in the bottom, this, these right here is mahi-mahi. This one in the middle is tuna. And this is an example of an amberjack. Um, you don't see many of these, uh, but when you do, you have to be very careful of the fish toxins. All right. Um, and the best way to prevent getting fish toxins is buy from a reputable vendor. Um, especially when we live in Connecticut, you have people who, who, who fish off of the shore of Connecticut and they want to sell it to the restaurant. They want to make a couple of bucks. You cannot buy from them. You need to buy from someone who's gone through all the FDA inspections make sure that they have all the all their HACCP plans in place and they're handling the fish the proper way. Okay, thank you very much and have a great day.